Okay, it is time for us to get into the Word. So I'm going to try to stay more stationary, but I'm going to be speaking here uh, and up here and up here. And hopefully you all are settled in and ready to go as we uh, partake or launch into our Advent series. And this series is going to be uh, four weeks, four parts. It's going to end on uh, December 20th. And we're going to look at four aspects of the names of Christ. So the title of this series is, He Shall Be Called. And today we're looking at this title of Emmanuel. And then again, we'll look at Wonderful Counselor next week, the week after, Everlasting Father. And then we'll finish with I am. And then on the 27th, Jim Black will be speaking as I and my family are going to be together for Christmas. And then the following week in January, we're going to launch into a new series. So that's what we are doing. Now, again, this story could be very, very familiar to us. We know about Jesus. We know about the manger. We know about the angels. We know so much because every year we refocus on this event. And it is important for us to do so. So I want you to listen today with new ears. I want you to focus your heart in. God, what are you speaking to me? And what does Emmanuel mean to me? So here are the three points, and we're going to talk about them one by one. Because God is with you, you have hope in every and all situations. Because God is with you, you have companionship in every season of your life. Because God is with you, you know what to do by looking to and following the example of Jesus. So first, we're going to talk about that you have hope. You have hope because Emmanuel, God, is with us. Now, the word Emmanuel is first recorded in chapter 7 of the book of Isaiah. So I'm going to set this passage up a little bit so you understand in the context of what was taking place. So at that time... Israel was divided into two kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom and there was a southern kingdom. And the kingdom that what the tribe of Judah was a part of, their king's name was Ahaz. So he was the king of the tribe of Judah from the line of David, and the capital was in Jerusalem. Now, at that very time where this passage comes to play, Ahaz and his kingdom were being attacked by the king of the rest of Israel. So all the other tribes were attacking Ahaz and the tribe of Judah, along with their ally from Aram. So these two kings were coming against Ahaz and the people. And scripture records that Ahaz and the people's hearts were... Shaken as the trees of the forest were shaken by the wind. They were scared, right? There was a, uh, a danger. There was an unknown future and people were coming against them. And they were shaking in their boots, so to speak. This is the context in which God sent a prophet named Isaiah to speak. Speak to this king. And this is a message that Isaiah spoke by the word of the Lord to Ahaz and these people. This is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 4, and then pulling together 7 and 9. Say to him, be careful, be calm, don't be afraid. Gave him something to do. Number one, be careful. Don't be frivolous in doing whatever you want. There is danger. So number one, you have a responsibility to be careful. Now, as you are being careful, keep calm, right? There is a frantic careful, and there is a calm 
careful. So be careful. Be calm. Don't be afraid. And then God tells Ahaz and his people the reason why. He says, listen, I'm going to tell you what happens. You and I can find comfort that God knows the future. Okay? He is sovereign. Even when we are scared and we don't know what's going to take place, God knows and God is there. And he says, because I know the future, let me tell you why I don't want you to be afraid. What these people are planning will not take place. It will not happen. That's the comfort comes from God's sovereignty and God being with us. And then he goes on and says to this king and also to us, If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. This wasn't about Ahaz being strong and delivering himself. It was him trusting that God would deliver him. Be careful, yes. Be calm. Be at, don't be afraid. But stand, because if you don't trust me, you're not going to stand at all. Now, God in his kindness, in his graciousness, says that he would provide Ahaz a sign. And he gave him an option. This is verse 10 of Isaiah chapter 7. Then the Lord sent this message to King Ahaz. He said, Ask the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation. Ask me for a sign of confirmation, Ahaz. Now, you can make it as difficult as you want. As high as the heavens or as deep as the place of the dead. But the king refused. No, he said. I won't test the Lord like that. Then Isaiah said, well, listen well, you royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of my God as, well, all right then. The Lord himself will give you the sign. Look. The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So there is the promise. Now this is a weird sign to a king that was facing difficulties. A virgin giving birth birth to a son whose name is to be Emmanuel, which means God with us. What? Now, Ahaz was thinking of his immediate issue of being delivered from the external evil and destruction, where God was thinking thinking about their eternal evil need of being delivered from the internal evil and destruction. God not only sees our immediate temporal need, he sees the pressures, he understands the fear, he knows what's happening right around us in our immediate context. But God is not just fixated on the immediate. God sees not only our situation, but he views it through the lens of eternity and understands what a real need is. So often we are fixated on the temporal, where God wants us and always tells us to look beyond this and look to your real need, which is eternal. Often we're concerned about the evil without. And God says, not only am I going to deliver you from that, but I'm going to deliver you from your bigger problem which is the evil within our hearts. So when God was speaking to this king, he was speaking to him but looking beyond him. 
There was a sign that was immediate, but also the sign was for another time in addressing an eternal need. God just isn't focused on the immediate, but he's focusing in on what we really need and the long term. Now, we can see this term, this word Emmanuel, then show up in the New Testament. And so we understand through that lens who this was. They're anticipating this virgin as a sign, and we know that through Mary. And Matthew picks up this language in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, because Joseph wasn't sure what was going on, right? Here his fiancé was now pregnant. He knew he didn't have anything to do with that. And so he was considering, boy, I don't know about this woman. I don't know if this is the right one. And apparently something happened. But God reassured Joseph what had indeed taken place. and said, do not fear to take her as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She, this virgin, will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. This was Jesus' primary mission. Now all this took place to fulfill. Here we go, Isaiah to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The hope that you have to defeat the evil without and the evil within is to be placed in the son who was born of a virgin. God is with us. And this God will save his people from their sins. Now the evil around us is indeed a problem. But again, the bigger problem is the evil within our own hearts. Because God says, I am present with you through my son Jesus, I will defeat them all. You, I, we must stand firm in our faith because if you do not, you will not stand at all. This word from Isaiah to Ahaz also echoes today. That we cannot ultimately deliver ourselves from evil. In particular, the evil of our own hearts. And so these words echo to that day and all the way to this day. And all the way into eternity. Telling us we have to stand firm in our faith. Believing that God will deliver us. Just like Ahaz had to believe God would deliver him temporarily. That we have to believe and stand firm in the faith because of this son that we will be delivered from evil eternally. If you do not stand in your faith, not in your works, (laughs) you will not stand at all. So know that in every evil and difficult situation that God is with you. He's with you. And if God is with you, you always have hope. In Christianity, there is no hopeless situation. Whether you're facing a brain tumor, whether you're facing a flat tire, whether you're facing a child that is run away from the family or the faith or confused in some way, because God is with us, we always have hope. Always have hope. (laughs) Because he will come through and deliver you. Excuse me. (coughs) 
got to love that. <laughs> in the end, put your hope and faith and trust in him. He promises that he will save his people from their sins. Now, I also want you to notice that God does not say that he will deliver you, deliver you from every difficulty and hardship over and over and over again in scripture god promises to be with us and he tells us to persevere and trust him in the midst of hardship he will be with you through it he promises you that and he promises that you will be delivered from the greatest evil which is deliverance from sin and death God always and forever keeps his promises. And if you are holding on to a promise, <laughs> make sure it's one that he gave. Now hear me. People greatly err when they become angry at God for not keeping promises he never made. Let me say that again. You and I, people, and I've heard this as a pastor time and time and time again, of people being angry at God for not keeping a promise that he never made. So, if you are believing God and you're trusting God, I have to say, well, what has God promised you? He promises you ultimate deliverance. From sin and death. Promised 100% guarantee. He also promises that he will be with us even to the ends of the earth. He promises us to, us to give us what we need when we need it. But sometimes we get healed. And sometimes we suffer. Sometimes we're given more time. And sometimes it's time to go home. So if you have found yourself and you are finding yourself now angry at God, make sure <laughs> that what you're angry about is accurate. Did he promise that he would heal your grandmother? He promises to be with her. He will be with you. Don't be angry at God for something he never promised you. And again, God always keeps his promises, so we do not have a right to be angry at him. Who are you, old oh man, to resist God? Do you not trust his character? That he is kind, that he is just, that he's holy, that he's sovereign, that he's all-knowing, that he's perfect, he's patient, he's loving, and he works all things together for good for those who love him. Obey him according to his promises. I want you to think about that. Where are you in your heart? God keeps his promises. You can trust him. He gives us everything we need for life and godliness. Continue to stand firm in your faith because if you do not stand firm, you will not stand at all. It takes greater faith to stand during opposition than it does to believe when everything is good. That's where faith shines the brightest when times are darkest. So continue to believe because with God, we always have hope in every and all situation. Remember that. So God is Emmanuel. God is with us. So therefore, we have hope. And because God is with you, we have companionship for every season of life. You have companionship. Now the good news is, if God is with you, you are never alone. David declared this in Psalm 139. He says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? <clears throat> if I ascend to heaven, 
you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, well, surely the darkness shall cover me, surely God could not find me then. And the light about me is night. Even the darkness is not dark to you, O God. The night is bright as the day. The darkness is as light with you. Everywhere you go, there God is. And we're talking about physical positions around the planet, from the reaches of the sea to the darkness of the depths. God knows where you are. From the highest heavens, from all over God knows you. God is present. And he's talking about a physical distance, but he's also talking about a theological, or the darkness of the soul. God can penetrate the hardest of hearts and the darkest of nights. God knows. If you think that God has forgotten you, you are wrong. He has not forgotten you. The Apostle Paul right, went through some dark nights of the soul right, when he was confronted by the glories of Christ. He was first blinded and then he was restored and he was sent out. And in some places he was well received with warmth. In other places he was stoned. And he was abandoned, and he was shipwrecked, and he was in prison. He went through all of this because of the gospel. And he, out of his own experience, through the power of the Holy Spirit, penned for us. He says, he says I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, or any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God will always love you or nothing or no one and can nor will separate him from you. He promises to be with us. Again, some of our most beloved scriptures convey this imagery to us, like Psalm 23. <laughs> Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Not the reality of death. Jesus took that reality, the shadow. It's better to be hit by a shadow of a semi-truck than it is to be hit by the semi-truck. Right? He took it head on and we just get the shadow. Right? Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to fear any evil. Why? You are with me. Rod, your staff, they comfort me. He will help you. He will guide you. He will protect you. He will not forsake you. He'll see you through. <laughs> see you through. Until you have completed your purpose here on earth. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For he is the good shepherd. David, who penned this, recognized this. It's picked up in the book of Acts, talking about David. It says, for David, after he had served the purposes of God in his own generation, he fell asleep. 
some point all of us are going to sleep. The sense of go through the valley of the shadow of death. But until then, we have a purpose. And when time is up, then time is up. But the good shepherd will be with us through all of those things. So we are to what? Be strong and courageous and do what he's called you to do. Do not be afraid. So this tells us that at times there are things to be frightened of and it's uncertainty and transitions happen and it's difficult. It says, hey, continue to do what I've called you to do. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, what? Is watching from a distance from his lazy boy wondering what's going to happen. Right? Doesn't say that. Come on. He says, hey, hey, hey. I am with you in this. God never asks us and calls us to do something that he doesn't do with us. He's our companion. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. And this is one of the last things that Jesus said to us before he ascended. Remember this? Matthew chapter 28. I will be with you, kind of, right? Until I get bored of you all, right? Didn't say that. I'll be with you always. How long? To the end of the age. This age is continuing. And this promise is for our ancestors. And this promise is for us. And this promise is for our children and our children's children and their children and their children and their children. He is eternal. He is with us. So because God is with us, you and I always have hope. Okay, Always. And because God is with us, we have companionship. He is with you in and through it all. You are never alone. And that should bring us courage. It should bring us comfort. This is what Emmanuel means to us. And I want you to personalize it, what it means to you. You will not and you do not walk alone. Now thirdly, because of Emmanuel, and there's lots of things I can put in here. (laughs) But as pastors, we give three points, right? And then a poem and then we're good. (laughs) I want you to focus in on these, right? Take the heart to this. Because Emmanuel is with us, you and I have an example. And we're going to talk about what that looks like and what this means. Now here's a question. What is better? To be told how to do something or to be shown how to do something? Oh, we can answer that well. To be shown is always better. Okay? Now when I was a young man... I worked for a church part-time, and I worked for a guy named Bruce Ram. Bruce Ram owned a company called Ramco Painting. And so I worked with Bruce because church was number one. Okay, It took my time, but I needed flexibility. Bruce was a part of the congregation. He says, you know what, I will take you on. So David became a painter. Now, Bruce could have told me, brought me to a room, and said, okay, paint this room, and left. Okay? Now, I knew that I needed to paint the room, but I really didn't know how to do it. So Bruce, being a good mentor, showed me how. And so I watched him, and we did it together as we prepared the room, okay? Got all the furniture in the middle. How do we set up tarps, and why we use cloth and not uh, not the cheap stuff, right? And how to fold them, okay? And then to dust off things, to pull the nails first, and how to um, put, put putty into the holes and, and make sure that they're all smooth and make sure everything is set up, set up. And then he showed me what to do. When you get two colors, you get two cans, you box them, you put them together. This is the back in the day where we filtered our paint. And how he showed me, oh, that's what you mean by that. 
And he says, now this is the brush you need to use, and this is why you need to use it. <laughs> a three-inch brush, a Wooster brush. He says, this is what we use. And then I'm going to show you how to paint. And he went slowly and showed me, this is how much pressure you need. This is where you need to get the, ba- um, the, the bead of the paint. And this is what you do, and this is how much room you make. And when you roll, okay, this is more information about painting than you ever wanted to know, okay? But when you roll, make sure this is how the pressure, use a handle and use this nap, okay? And then all of that, and then when you clean brushes, and if you ever clean brushes with me, you better clean those brushes well, right? This is how you clean a brush. This is how you take care of it. You take care of your tools, Your tools will take care of you. And so I have brushes that I've used because I've cleaned them thoroughly, okay? Now, Bruce could have just said, paint the room, right? But he showed me what he meant by paint the room. He did it with me. I watched him, and then I did as he did. So being shown to do something is much better than being told to do something. Now we're going to fast forward this to our spiritual life. So we know, and God told his people in Deuteronomy and other places what we are to do. This is Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now, O Israel, and now, O my people, which extends to you, what does the Lord your God require of you? Okay. Good to know. But to fear the Lord your God. Okay. Not to fear everything else, but to fear him. Okay. To walk in all his ways, to love him. There's a respect and an honoring and a fear combined with following him, combined with loving him. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Sound familiar? Right? All your strength. And to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, statutes of the Lord which I am commanding you today. Why? I like this. For your good. For your good. Do this and it will go well with you. So he told us what to do. In Christ he showed us how to do it. John chapter 1 verse 14. I love the opening of the gospel of John. It is profound. Verse 14 it says this. And the word became flesh. This command, the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, God with us. The same concept dwelt among us like he tabernacled in the Old Testament. Now the word is becoming flesh in the New Testament, living among us. The message version says he built his tent with us, or he moved into the neighborhood. I like that. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So God told us what to do, and in Christ, he showed us how to do it. And John says, We've seen his glory. Now, what is glory? What is this? Okay. God's glory is God's goodness. And the glory of an individual is seen in what they do, in their goodness. The glory of God is seen in his goodness. Why can I say that? Because of Exodus chapter 33. This was a conversation in which Moses had with God. And Moses was asking God, God, show me your glory. And God said in verse 19, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. So God's glory is seen in his goodness. And when John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, that means they saw him. And they saw what he did. We we saw his goodness. And it came in both grace and truth. We saw how he interacted with a woman caught in adultery and forgave her and then told her not to sin anymore. We saw him confront evil demonic forces and give grace to those who were oppressed and possessed. 
We saw Jesus confront the pride of the arrogant Pharisees. And we saw him embrace the humble and the poor. Because God is with us, we have an example. The word became fresh. This is flesh. This is how you do life. This is how you interact with Pharisees and friends and family and community and government and powers. I know uh, uh, a little while ago, there was a popular thing. Remember these little rubber things we had? What would Jesus do? Remember those? Right? WWJD. That's a helpful thing. And we wore them, remember? We had t-shirts. It was a big thing. But the principle is still the same. We have to ask ourselves, how do I do this? You have a situation that's difficult. You have something that you're facing. You have an interaction with somebody. We should be asking ourselves, how would Jesus handle this situation? How would Jesus spend his time today? In order to answer that question, you have to know Christ. In order to know Christ, you need to read about him. In order to read about him, you have to be intentional about that. You have to participate. And hopefully God will provide you examples of how did my grandfather handle that? How did my mom handle that? Who can I look to that would handle that? Ultimately, we are to look to Christ. And we and I and you get in trouble when we don't ask ourselves what would Jesus do in this circumstance. And often we don't think that way. I want you to think that way. The Word became flesh to give us hope, absolutely. The Word became flesh to be a, to be a companion with us in all things, absolutely. The Word also became flesh to show us God's glory and His goodness and to, for us to know what to do. <laughs> Later on in John he records the words of Christ who said, For I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. And this is the context of washing the disciples' feet, of becoming a servant. This is servant later, leadership being down and saying, I'm here to serve. I'm doing this for you, but I'm also giving you an example that you to do as I do. And Peter records similar words in chapter 2 of his first letter. Christ also suffered for you, leaving you and me an example so that you, so that I, so that we might Follow in his steps. So this baby, born of a virgin, which was promised from the beginning of creation. Okay? He is the lamb that was slain before anything was created. This son was foreshadowed shadowed in the Garden of Eden. This son was proclaimed throughout Old Testament. This son was received 2,000 or so years ago. This son tabernacled, moved into our neighborhood. The word became flesh so that we may also follow in his footsteps. And so as we conclude, and we will, we will sing together, I want you to consider these things. <clears throat> I want you to consider that you do have hope. Take that to heart. Regardless of what you're facing, I want you to know that you have hope. We, as God's people, should be a people of hope. 
Second, that you and I have companionship, that you are not alone and God is with us experiencing and walking alongside us. But also we have an example. And I want you to be asking this question. It's the question that I need to ask more than I do. And I try. Jesus, how would you handle this circumstance? Which requires humility. Which requires the obedience of faith. (laughs) Which requires looking to him and that his name would be glorified. In so doing, it'll help us. So again, I don't know what you're facing today. I know some, but I don't know every. I don't know all, but God does. Be thankful that this Emmanuel who is with us, look to him in hope, look to him for companionship, look to him as an example. Turn to him and he will guide you and be with you always. So receive the gift of the Son. Rejoice in the gift that has been given. Worship God in the highest, who has given us the greatest of all gifts, the gift of himself. So let's pray together right now. So God, here we are, gathered in different places, but focused in on your word, your son, your gift. And God, as we have prayed even this morning, we pray again that you would help our hearts to understand and absorb what this means for us. God, we're grateful that in you we have hope. God, we're grateful that in you we have companionship. God, we are grateful. In you we have an example to follow. So God, in the stillness of this moment, help the soil of our soul to absorb the seed of your word and produce in us the fruit of your Spirit's work in us. Help us to stand firm in our faith, to keep our eyes fixed on you. And God, we give you glory for this great gift, the gift that keeps on giving, the gift that delivers us from the evil without, and the gift that delivers us from the evil within. God with us, Emmanuel. So God, we praise you this day. In Jesus' name, amen.